chapter nine is over one of my favorite words or phrases to say um, when it comes to the culinary arts. And chapter nine, the word there is mise en place. Mise en place. So what does mise en place mean? Well, the literal translation means to put in place or everything in its place. For us, mise en place is our prep. So it's our organizing and the planning, it's the gathering and preparing, and it's the assembling of all of our stuff that we need. So everything that leads up to the actual cooking of the product is all part of mise en place. So first thing as a chef that you're gonna probably run into with mise en place is a prep list. And of course a prep list is that blueprint. It talks about food production, what needs to be produced, how things are going to be done during the course of the day. Um, depending on how in depth you get, it looks at how things need to be done, how long it should take to do it, the order in which you should uh, be doing it to make sure you get it done um, in the best amount of time. And in some cases, how each person interacts with each other um, in the kitchen to get that stuff done. So when you're looking to write one, it's not just rewriting down the recipes. You've really got to look at composing a map of what you want to accomplish, when you want it accomplished, how you want it accomplished. And a lot of it's going to depend on who your um, employees are. If you have a lot of employees that are been in the industry for a while, that, you know, culinary school, that are um, fairly competent within uh, the industry, it might just be a matter of putting the uh, list out there and because of their knowledge and experience, they know, okay, I need to do this first, I need to do this next, et cetera, et cetera. If you are working with people um, that are new to the industry or those that maybe either it's, it's just their job until they find their career, um, you might need to be more in depth and making sure this is what you need to start first. And while this is going, this is what you're going to do. And you really put that roadmap together, that map of how uh, things need to be done. And um, so you really got to gauge your employee level of commitment and their knowledge and stuff to really help with that. And then you can start putting together that roadmap for what needs to be done as far as the prep list. So here's an example from the book of a, a sample prep list. Um, you know, what needs to be done, where it's coming from, how much of it needs to be prepped so everything is ready to go for the service time when it's actually time to start assembling and cooking of product. Um, when we're planning a lot of times, we look at quantity planning. So how much do we make? Well, a lot of times we base on what's called a PAR. And so a PAR is a standard amount that we should always have on hand. So for example, if the PAR is 15 orders of London broil, or maybe the PAR is one pint of marinade. And so the prep list looks at, okay, this is the PAR, here's how much we actually have. And so that lets you know how much needs to be taken care of as far as product. So if you're using that London broil, it's 15 is the PAR and you only have 10, then you need to prep five London broils to make sure you're back up to that par stock, that par level. Right? Um, another part of it after the prep list is of course making sure your tools and equipment are where they need to be. So making sure everything is clean and sanitized, knives are honed and sharpened, uh, accurate, check for accuracy periodically on your measuring devices, making sure ovens and surfaces are preheated if necessary, making sure you have the appropriate bowls, pans, containers um, for the task at hand fairly close by so you're being making the most efficient use of your time. Um, having serving plates, cookware, utensils, tools, anything uh, stored nearby again so you're not having to go far distances to go get them. Make sure foods are gathered and stored at the right temperature check your expiration dates, make sure everything is still good to use. And then of course have your sanitizing solutions underneath, having towels available as need be, make sure you have gloves available and the trash receptacles. Everything should be located again so you're working smarter, not harder. You know, the idea is to take as few number of steps as you can so you can work as efficiently as you possibly can when it comes to putting together um, all those tools and equipment. The next thing, which is I think the most common part of 
uh, measuring ingredient is really that measuring of ingredients as far as the mise en place, because we got to make sure everything is in the right size, the right weight, the right number, the right volume, all those things need to be done before we can go ahead and get into the cooking process. So all your weighing and measuring is all part of mise en place. Measuring your liquids and your measuring cups, all part of mise en place. Measuring your dry ingredients, again, all part of the mise en place process. Um, other things include preparing ingredients. So uh, some things you can do in large quantities and hold for later. Other things are done as they need. So for example, um, clarifying butter, which we'll talk about in a second, is something that can be prepped up ahead of time. Uh, toasting of nuts or spices, making breadcrumbs, making bouquet garnis and sachets, which we'll talk about in a minute. Marinating meats and poultry, steeping dry ingredients, all of those are part of the mise en place to prepare the ingredients for the actual cooking. So what is clarified butter? Clarified butter is um, where you take whole butter and you separate it into its three components and you remove the milk solids and the water. So there's three parts, milk solids, water, and butter fat. So the way it works is you slowly warm the butter um, over low heat, don't stir it or anything like that. While the butter melts, the milk solids rise to the top, the water sinks to the bottom. Then as soon as the butter is melted, then you skim the milk fat, the, sorry, the milk solids off the top, and then you pour the butter fat into a clean saucepan and you do it carefully enough that you make sure you leave the water in the bottom of the pan. You don't get that water uh, transferred over. Once you've had that done, now you've got clarified butter that you can use for cooking. Um, the milk solids uh, are the reason why the whole butter burns when you try to cook with it. Then when you separate it out and melt it and then you get water and oil, you know, water and oil don't mix very well. The water's at the bottom, it's getting hot, it turns to steam, but the butter's over top of it and so it forces its way through and that's where you get a lot of pop, 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 pop and you know, those uh, burns that come happen when you're cooking a lot of times with whole butter. So that's why it's better to clarify it and just use that butter fat or that clarified butter if you're going to cook with it. So um, toasting nuts and spices, um, by toasting nuts and spices before you cook with them, it helps to bring out their flavors. Um, you can do it on the stovetop or in the oven. Um, you just be careful, especially on the, in the, on the stovetop, they don't burn or leave them in the oven too long. Um, but look for it, the color change, so a light color, darker color, and of course, smell. Uh, notice the, the aroma and the fragrant aroma. Once you get to that, you know that you've got it to the consistency that you'd be looking for. Some ways to add flavorings to liquids without keeping product in are bouquet garnis and sachets. So these introduce uh, herbs, spices, and a few other elements into stocks, uh, soups, sauces, and stews. If you marinate, uh, you are soaking meat and poultry in a seasoned liquid to flavorize and tender. Um, so you can do a brine or a sal or salty marinades, a liquid form. Rubs are dry uh, marinades that get uh, rubbed onto meats and poultries. And then steeping um, is a matter of rehydrating dried fruits, um, imparting flavor into a liquid through like a tea or something along those lines. Um, marinating and stuff you will get into when you get into garmage class. Uh, we talk about that pretty extensively. Now, the bouquet garni is a selection of herbs, typically fresh, and veggies that we tie into a bundle with some butcher's twine, and then that goes into cooking with in the liquid, and then when the time comes, we're done with it, you take your tongs, you remove it out, you've imparted the flavor of those ingredients, but you're not leaving them in there. So a standard bouquet garni is parsley stems, celery, thyme, leeks and carrot and you can see there you've got them into these large sticks you bind them all together with the butcher's twine throw it in and then let those flavors steep into the cooking liquid that you're working with and then you remove it when it's done the other option is a sachet and a sachet is made by tying smaller uh, things of seasoning up in cheesecloth 
So sachet consists of peppercorns, usually crushed, some bay leaf, parsley stems, uh, thyme, fresh or dry, uh, clove, and sometimes garlic. I don't use garlic in my stocks unless I'm doing like a veggie stock or something because I can always add garlic later. But some chefs do use uh, garlic. If you notice, both of them, uh, the sachet and the bouquet garni, ask for parsley stems. There's a reason why we're using stems and not the parsley leaves. And when you think about it, it makes sense. If you're using parsley, you're using the leaves. You're gonna chop it up and put it into a salad or make uh, something out of it. You're gonna use it as a garnish. And what do you usually do with the stems? You throw them away or you throw them in the compost bin. Well, the stems also have the parsley flavor. They just don't look pretty. So why not use the stems to impart flavor like we are through a sachet or a bouquet garni, and then we don't have to worry about that, um, about using the leaves. We can use those for other options. So that's the reason why we use the parsley stems and not the leaves when we are doing sachets and bouquet garnies. Some other things as far as preparing to cook, um, breading and battering of foods, and also blanching and par cooking or par boiling uh, items are a couple other things. So uh, the standard breading procedure, that is something I am gonna ask you about as well and what's the steps in it. And so it's three parts, flour, egg wash, breadcrumbs. And you can see right there, you have your products, let's say you have your chicken breast, you dredge it in flour, you dip it in egg wash, then you coat it in the breadcrumbs and then it's ready to go get fried, pan fried, deep fried, whatever the case may be. Now breadcrumbs of course is a very generic term. So you can use traditional breadcrumbs, you can use panko, uh, Japanese breadcrumbs, which are more coarser flake breadcrumb. You can use other things that you would consider breadcrumbs. Um, I've had some fun stuff with chips, you know, crush up chips or Doritos, and you could use those as a breadcrumb for the outside. Um, I've actually, one of the fun things I've done before, I've used um, Captain Crunch. No crunch berries, just straight Captain Crunch, crush it up and use it as the breadcrumb for the standard breading procedure for like chicken. So you get this lightly sweetness that goes uh, with that uh, fried chicken uh, strips or chicken tenders type of thing. But you can have some fun and really play around with flavor profiles as far as that breadcrumb. It does not have to be just a traditional type breadcrumb. Now a battering procedure, um, you can see set up here, um, it's flour, batter, and then into the cooking process. So a batter is, a dry, uh, some sort of typically some sort of starch that you add liquid to. So whether it's flour based or it's cornstarch based or um, potato starch or whatever that base may be, there might be other uh, flavoring sweeteners, uh, baking powders to help with the lightness of it. But then you add a liquid to it to turn it into that batter that's going to then coat the product that you're working with. And the liquid is really your choice. You know, it could be water, it could be stock. You know, a lot of times you hear like beer batter, you know, for fish. They use, you know, a can of beer with uh, the starch and stuff in order to get to that batter consistency. Um, you know, the sky's the limit, just limited by your imagination and your guest's willingness to try what you've created. So there's also that standard battering procedure where you flour the product first and then dip it in the batter. The flour helps the batter to adhere better um, when it comes to that finished product. Blanching and parboiling. So you want to make sure that you we there's a you want to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and blanching and parboiling are done for many different reasons. So um, one thing it can do, it can help loosen the peel of an item. Um, it can help remove undesirable flavors. If stuff is too strong, you can pull some of those strong flavors out so it's not as strong when you finish. It can soften up firm foods. It can help set the color of a product and also shorten the cooking time. So blanching is shorter than par cooking or par boiling. Um, if you are blanching or par boiling foods in water, then what you would do is you would then submerge them in ice water to what they call shock or refresh, which stops the cooking process. So for a thing called tomato concasse, it's a tomato that we um, blanch and then shock, and then we're able to peel it, de-seed it, and then do a rough chop to it. 
but that's part of this blanch and shock process. If I'm working with those batonne of carrot, if I try to saute a batonne of carrot from start from raw to finish, I'm either going to have perfectly cooked on the outside and raw in the center still, or it's going to be perfectly cooked on the inside and overcooked on the outside. And so what you would do is you would par cook the carrots like in water or stock to get them, let's say about three quarters of the way cooked, then pull them out, shock them in water to stop the cooking process. And then you can hold them till you're ready to use them. That's all part of the mise en place. And then when the time comes, make sure they're dry. There's no water on them. You get yourself some fat, throw it in a pan. You throw in your carrots. You saute those carrots up and bada bing, bada boom. You then have your sauteed carrots, but they're perfectly cooked with a nice coloring and you don't have to worry about them being overcooked or undercooked. So that's why it's important that if they need to be done that you do either a blanche or a shock. But again, that's all part of the mise en place. Ice bath, um, fairly simple to put together. Um, uh, it's usually equal parts ice and water. Um, you'll find that ice water will chill more rapidly than just ice. Um, and you also find that chills more rapidly than putting something in the refrigerator. Um, the water uh, draws heat out. The cold water draws heat out faster than cold air. Um, you find that water is a better conductor of heat and cool and than air is. So that's going to, if you want to do it real fast, your ice bath is going to be your best bet. Um, and you see, if you see people add salt, um, it's because salt lowers the freezing point of the water. So it gets colder without it uh, setting on you. So that's also why people that do old school um, ice cream, then the churn, uh, ice cream churns, they'll, they'll put their salt in with the ice that's on the outside because again, it lowers that freezing point. So it helps to freeze faster as well. A little extra tidbit of information there for you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all about mise en place. Again, one of my favorite terms to use. You're going to hear me use it a lot um, because I want you to make sure that you are mise en place and ready to go before you move into that next step, especially when it comes to cooking. So thanks for watching all about mise en place, and we'll see you soon.